Have you ever had something in your life, though, like, like what I just demonstrated, that was a problem? And, and, and as long as that, that problem was in your life, it caused problems. It, it like reached into the different very uh, uh, veins within your life, and it was just a poison that spread within your life. And so the best thing you could do was to cut that problem out. Just get rid of it so that the problem isn't a part of your life. Do you, do you, do you know what I'm, can, can you relate to what I'm trying to say today? Um, this is how I feel toward onions. <laughs> I feel that way toward onions. I, 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 I'm, people, people look at me and my wife goes, you're such a picky eater. And I go, no, I'm not. I'm not I have three things that I, I just don't eat, okay? Onions is one of them. Potatoes is the other one, and peas. Oh. I don't touch peas. In fact, I'm to the point where I don't trust um, when I when I order a when I order a, like a cheeseburger at a, at a restaurant or something like that. I don't trust the cut. Now I'll always order, please no onion. I'll beg if I have to, no onion, because um, I've, I've taken that bite before. And, and if you have a, a, a flavor of that you don't like, and you take a bite and you get a mouthful of it, you can relate to that. But you take that bite and onions are so potent to me that yeah, I can take the bite, I feel the onion, it spreads to my mouth like a cancer, I, I go to my mouth, I, I pull it off the burger, but yet the entire thing that I'm eating, the, the onion's just there, it's perfect. So I've just removed onions from my life. <laughs> it, it's actually funny because my wife feels the same way. Uh, her uh, code was, when I, when, I, when I go to find a man, God will show me it's the right one if he doesn't like onions. <laughs> she hates onions, I hate onions. So we don't put onions on anything within our family. But what we understand is that the Dallas Cowboys, thanks for the coat, had a player about, about seven years ago that was really talented. He added a lot of talent to the team, but he was a cancer to the team. And if he didn't get his way, if the ball wasn't thrown to him enough, if he didn't get treated fairly, he, he would fold his arm, and it was nothing to see him on the sideline like this. You know, and, and more people around him would just be like, you know, rolling their eyes, and, and eventually the coach, he was talented, but, but it, was, it was a greater help to the team to just cut the guy. And so they cut the guy, and within a year, the Cowboys were able to pull themselves out of that. No team would pick that player up, because they knew he was such a cancer. It's hard to do this sometimes in our lives. To, to look into our situations and say, this is a cancer. If I let, this is a poison. If, if I continue to let this happen, it's going to cause me a problem. It's going to cause a problem. So I need to cut this out of my life. Now, in the text today, as we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, the priests are the source of the problem behind Israel's lack of love and devotion toward God. And in the last couple of weeks, we've seen God come to the priests really, real personal and begin to talk to them and say, if this behavior of dishonoring my name continues to go on, I'm going to curse you. I'm going to cause this tribulational element in your life that A, is going to cause you to, to hopefully stop it. And, and I'll remind you of, of, of that. We talked about that last week. I'll curse the blessings. Again, it's not beyond God to curse the blessings, to say, I'm going to do what I have to do to remind you. I am the biggest deal going on. Okay. But, but the other two elements that we're talking about, we're summing it all up today, is that he goes into this idea, I'm going to curse the descendants, and it's going to humiliate you. Okay. And uh, so we'll dive into what that has to do with the curse here in a little bit. But uh, I, I want to read the word to kind of reset what that looks like. So Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. It's on the screen behind me. I, I'd encourage you to keep the text open as we go through the word today as we'll kind of hit some of those verses. Here it is again. Malachi chapter 2, 1 through 9. And now, you priests, this warning is for you. If you do not listen and if you do not resolve to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty. I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not resolved to honor my name. Me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I have sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him. A covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many away from sin. 
For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty, and people seek instruction from his mouth. But you have turned from the way, and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people, because you have not followed my way, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. So let's dive into this and this curse of the descendants. Again, God's talking to the priest here. He, he's now taking the warning to a, a rebuke of the descendants. And, and I think to clearly understand what it means when he says the descendants, we first look at the word rebuke, which is the word in, in Hebrew is, is ge'ar, long A before the second A, but ge'ar, um, which means to rebuke. <laughs> and, and, and two other words that can go along with it, to be cut off or to be reprimanded. So, verse 3, looking at that, it, it tells us that the dung of the sacrifice was going to be smeared on these, these God-dishonoring priest's faces, which would be carried off, okay, cast off. And when we look at that concept, as well as what this rebuke might possibly be, we get this idea that this, this really detestable, concepted, gross thing is going to happen to them, which would be then carried off or cast off. So it's clear for us to us, if this behavior does not stop, there will be a cutting off, a casting off, so that it does not continue to happen. Now this is, I, I struggled to find the right word this week. But the word that I settled upon with, with maybe a little bit of movement, if you know a better word, just fill it in with your brain. But this is kind of an insult from God toward the priests. It, it's kind of a, a, a he's, he's associating him with dung, okay? And it, it, it's an extreme as well because God's saying, I'm going to smear the dung on your face and it will be carried off. It will be cast off. And the sacrifice within the temple would be taken care of. Uh, yes, the... The animal would be brought in, the, the blood would be splattered across the Holy of Holy, the, the, the temple there. And there would be a processing of sorts that would take place within the animal. And um, a part of that would be to carry off the offal. And some of the texts would use that word, the offal, or the, the dung that is within the stomach content of the animal. And so they, they would take the, 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 the gross stuff, they would carry it outside the temple, and they would get it as far away from the sacrifice as they possibly could. Because if they didn't, they, they, they ran the chance of somehow getting that, that dung, that offal, that stomach content smeared in with the good meat, which would then spoil like cancer and spread to the good parts of the meat and cause it to be this, this nasty, gross thing. Even to this day, how many of us have gutted out an animal? We're in Wyoming, so that's fairly frequent. The first thing you do is to get rid of the stomach, amen? I and mean, that's what you do. I mean, that's what my father taught us, what his father taught him. You get rid of that because if it gets into the meat, it'll spoil it. And if you eat that meat, it has bacteria in it. It could kill you. So, so think about what God's saying there. He's saying, priest, I'm going to smear this on you. I'm associating you with this good-for-nothing, disease-causing uh, uh, poison, and I'm going to cast it out of the temple if you don't stop this defiling of my name. I've never been, okay, this is, this is kind of where the insult is at. <laughs> because he's saying, I'm associating you with dumb. You're, 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 you're nothing but a spoiled, gross, cancerous, good for nothing, but to be thrown out of the temple. Oh, I hope, I hope you connect the dots on how that translates to us. <laughs> Lest we ever, in the eyes of God, live life in such a capacity that that's what's said about us from God. Those seem like, like they might be harsh words, but I, I think God's getting the point made there that I will get rid of the defilement. My name will be holy. It will be great amongst the nations. We've read the last couple of weeks, and I will get rid of the thing that taints the rest of the meat. And that's kind of part of the curse there. 
You see, the way this affected the descendants is that if, if God put these God dishonoring priests out of the temple, and the way priests became priests was the Levites could have children. If you ever read that through the De Deuteronic code there, the priests could have children. They did get married, and so the bloodline of Levi would go on, and so the process would be that they'd become priests. And so if these, if these priests that dishonored God's name were allowed to have children, they would teach them to dishonor God. And, and if they had children, they would teach them to dishonor God. And, and, and thus you come to 2016 America. We got a whole bunch of people that just live this life of like, who cares, this dishonor to all things and humanity and, and spoiled brattiness. Next thing you know, you got, you got a bunch of kids out there that just don't care about anything. So here's God coming to the temple and he's saying, I'm going to cut off this, this part here that's causing the, 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 the whole thing to spoil. My, my father used to buy a 12 pound brick of cheese. Did anybody else ever do that? We were, I didn't know we were poor when I was a kid. But in my father's eyes, that's how you saved money because it lasted really long. And um, so we, I, because of this illustration, I buy shredded cheese today because it, it goes faster. But you used to have to get out that like weapon looking cheese grater. You know, they're antiques now, but, but on this side it was like for Parmesan, on this side was like this like knife that if you got cut too close to your hand, like cut your finger out. And then on this side it had those like little concave bigger chunks of cheese. And so you just sit there and go like this, lest you get your finger too close to it and it'll just grind right off if you spoil the whole brick of cheese. Every once in a while, there'd be a little bit of mold that would grow on the cheese. And again, my father wouldn't just take the cheese and throw it away. This is the same father, by the way, that would yeah. take milk and water it down to fool us kids <laughs> that it was a new gallon of milk, but it was just watered down 2%. <laughs> but he would take the brick of cheese. He'd see the spot of mold and he'd just Cut off the mold, throw it away, and you eat the rest of the bread. Lest we go on vacation, though, and that bought, and I always, always laugh because we'd go on vacation and, and Dad would be like, hey, all right, who's, who, who cut off the moldy section? Did anybody cut the moldy sections off the cheese so we can go on vacation? So when we'd come back, the cheese would be good, you know? Because if we ever did forget, that mold would just erupt over the cheese, and then it's good for nothing. <laughs> you throw that thing away, because it's going to spoil. It's a bad illustration, but it's where God's going with this. The brick of cheese is Israel, if you will. He's going to preserve his priesthood. And in our text, he's basically saying, I'm going to cut off the pieces that are going to cause the brick to go. Because we know from the covenant, as it, as it just spoke there in verse 4, that God tells them, I'm doing this because I'm, I'm, I'm wanting the covenant with Levi to continue. I will preserve that. That's going to happen. So in order so, to, for that to happen, I have to get rid of the parts that might possibly cause it to stop. And God had a covenant with the Levites. I'm not going to change that priesthood. Therefore, I have to do what I have to do to maintain the priesthood. struggled with how to say this part today because I, I just I believe that the church needs to pay attention to that in 2016 even today I've always said this about the Matt Tiger ministry God's ministry that I've, I've never been very concerned about growing a church to like epic proportions like intensely in fact if we were to just like overnight become 700 strong part of me would be like something's not right um, because a true authentic message of God truly tries people and will bring people to humility and to their knees and um, that's not always something that people do very easy so churches don't grow fast I truly believe that are truly growing spiritual depth amongst what they do have um, we are a message of hope can I get an amen faith love we want Jesus to be made known we're gonna do everything we can in fact to go to the gospel to bring the gospel in a faith hope and love we accept you we embrace you right where you are at Jesus Christ is the way the truth and the life there's no other way to the heaven except through him we're gonna bring the gospel can I get an amen, amen. but they're gonna deny it a lot the majority of them why is the way that leads to hell and sometimes within the church, 
We will present a gospel that has that same love, that same compassion, that same goodness. And there will be some in the church that will say, no, I will not accept that. I will not embrace that. And that's where we truly do have to be careful. I realize that this is going out on the web. And, and I don't want to come across as a pastor that says, oh, we've got to kick him out of the church. But hear what Jesus, what God is saying to Malachi in the temple with the priesthood. If we allow poison, to be in the church. Poison spreads. If we allow dung to be within the church, dung can spoil the meat. If we let it continue to saturate the roots and build and grow and continue to destroy what he's got going on, churches can topple because of that. And so I, I, I look at this passage of scripture to be careful, to, to remind ourselves that there's a value to maintaining the priesthood, a value to maintaining the truth about God. Amen? I, I thought about bringing in a two liter of pot. And, and what I was going to do is I was going to shake it up and open it up on all of you. <laughs> Just joking, I wasn't. But I was once at a, a district, district assembly when one of our biggest churches in Indiana, about 1500 in South Bend, Indiana, came in to give his report. He had a pop, and the whole time he's just shaking the pop up. And he's giving this great report, these great things the church is doing. In fact, in that one year, they had a 700, not membership or new believers increase, but a 700 attendance increase. 700 people in one year. And he was shaking up his pop, and at the very end of his, to his statement, he goes, you know, um, because we had 700 new people come this next year. And he walked up to the audience and he went like this. And the audience just went, ah! and, he, and he didn't do it. He closed it really quick. And he goes, and I want to tell you something. This next year, God's going to shake my church up. Because I've had 700 people who are coming to our church that are a poison, that are a cancer. And it is going to destroy our church. And he said, God's going to break the lid off of my church. And we're going to be a spiritually deep people. And I had such depth for that. Because I mean, what pastor would want to stand up there and be like, 1,700 people in my church. But he stood up there and went, and, and they are not where they're supposed to be. So God's going to shake us up. He came back that next year, and everybody was uh, kind of <laughs> like, what's going on? And, and he had decreased in 350 people. And he went into that, and everybody was moved to tears by it. But he came into that, that testimony, he was like, but we are an alive people. <laughs> he, and he just got up there and was like, Jesus is alive in South Bend. And for the first time, we are a spiritually thick people. And all of us just went, amen. Because it's not about the, it's, it's not about this idea of, okay, I'm, I'm this, it's about being spiritually Thick people. And, 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 and so it's not beyond God to say, I'm going to do what I have to do to make sure that the, the, the priesthood remains the priesthood. The church remains the church. And sometimes that means that people get have to go. If it's a cancer in the church, if it's destroying the church, we can't let that happen. Because what ends up happening is we get all these mega churches out there. You might as well not even preach this. We've got a bunch of watered-down gospel being spoken out there. And as we're about to talk about, lead people more into sin than they do into the way of righteousness with God. And I promise you, I'm not, not going to let that happen in this church. And it's hard. It's hard sometimes to say we've got to cut some of the mold out, lest it take over the whole brick of cheese. So, so I guess the question is, how do I make that personal? And, and, and so I, I'm just going to go cheesy again. Get, get it? Cheesy. Um, you are a brick of cheese. <laughs> and if we let mold start growing in our lives, that, that's where Jesus is saying, hey, now, let's cut some of that out. Let's get rid of the stuff that's going to corrupt you and destroy you. You know what that is. You know where you're at with lust, with vanity. With, with worldly, ideological living. You know your situations. He's a good God. <laughs> and he'll say, hey, this is moldy. This could kill the church, the whole brick. Let's get that out of there. So that the whole brick of cheese can be salvageable. So church, I think we hear the message today of, of God will preserve his priesthood. And that's, that's a big part of what we do. 
is, is preserve the priesthood at the church. We, we get into our lives, we look into our lives, and we say, what has to go that I might possibly become a greater priest in the eyes of God? Because that's ultimately what God is getting at in this text. He, he, he gives us great understanding of what Levi was. Uh, uh, this, this wonderful, now in, in other parts where Levi is mentioned, it's not as like, pointed about what he did for God's glory, but here in, in Malachi, he gives this really good understanding of who Levi was. And he was a good priest in, in the eyes of God. God. God gave him a covenant of peace and life because he revered, he stood in awe of God's name. He, he spoke true instruction, nothing false came from his mouth. He walked with God in peace and uprightness and he turned a lot of people away from sin. And that's what he said, that, that's a good priesthood. He said, this is what the, I had a covenant with this guy because that's what a priest looks like. But clearly, you priests that are here in Malachi that are defiling my name, in verse 8, he says, you've turned from your way and by your teaching, you've caused more to stumble. You, you violated the covenant with Levi. The priest demonstrated what frustrated God. <laughs> And, and, and God saying, Levi demonstrates what I'm pleased with. This is what I, what I want the priesthood to look like. For, for the lips of a priest, they preserve knowledge. They are messengers of the Lord Almighty. They seek the, because they will seek instruction from their mouths. So get, uh, being a priest of Levi, it honors God's name, preserves the truth of God. They give instruction. They lead people to Christ. They don't take away from Christ. Now, I, I think the idea is today is to look at what God was frustrated with. And what God said, I'm pleased with. And then look in our lives and go, I think I'd rather please God. Lest he call me dumb. Nothing, that I'm good for nothing but to be thrown out. Other parts of scripture call it being trampled by men. Whether it's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you, you get the point. God was pleased with Truth preservation. Can I get an amen? Love Sunday school class. He's pleased with truth preservation. Where this is what we preach. This is what we teach. Amen. He's pleased with peace. Oh man. If there's an election going on. <laughs> we talked a little bit about that Sunday school too. He's pleased with peace. I think the knowledge of knowing that yeah. It's not ideal. But God is. And then he's got it under control. Awe of his name. Amen. I went up to Red Lodge. You ladies went up there. And I just looked down at Little Valley. Going to go see Phyllis there. And I, we looked down and we saw this beautiful, wonderful, little, like, colorful city. And I just went, ooh, God is pretty. God can do that. Just imagine the fullness. Truth instruction. We, we, we speak the word. No false thing comes from the tongue uprightness. And these are priests that God says, I'm, I'm pleased with. So hear the message today. God lifts up those that lift him up. And those that choose to cast God out, God says, I'll let you. Do you, do you understand that? God, God lets you choose the world. He loves you. He does. He really does. And he loves you so much to the point where if you choose to want to live for the world, he'll, he'll let you live for the world. That's actually a great attribute of love. He'll let you be, he'll let you cast yourselves out of the temple. He won't give up, he won't give up without a fight, though. I love that about God. He'll always remind you, I'm right here. I'm right here. But the priests, I think, had a choice then. We have a choice today. Do, do, I, do I live like a priest that God, God says, I'm, I'm frustrated with that? Do, do I live like a priest that, that, that we have a good example of here that God says, I am so pleased with that? Because I may, I may struggle to do this justice today, but, but in, I think one day, I, some, we often call it judgment day, we get fearful with that word or whatever, but there will be a day that does come where the humiliation of what it means to be put out is going to be so much more clear than anything we ever experienced here on this planet. Because um, because y'all know that scripture. It's in uh, Matthew 7, 22 to 23. It's the Lord, Lord passages. And that there will be a bunch that will say to the Lord, 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 didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name? Didn't we perform any miracles in your name? And then he's going to look at them plainly, which I love that word. He's just going to bluntly go, I don't know. You are an evildoer. Go away. He's going to cast out. 
And and I I don't know what that day is going to be look what it's going to look like, but I can't help but look at that day as a pretty humiliating day for a lot of people. Because there's a lot of what that screams to me is there's a lot of people that live like these priests that quiet that that, that 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 proclaim that call out I'm a priest. But yet, by the way they live their lives, it, it, it distracts people. It pulls people away from God versus pulling people toward God. And there's going to be a lot of people on Judgment Day that, that claimed Christianity because they lived the way they lived. It was more harmful to him than it was glorifying to him. Now, that's not meant to fear anything in, this, in, the, in the submission or the salvation. But what this is meant to do today is that I'm, I don't want to be humiliated. Amen. <laughs> In this life, we're in the one to come. This, in, in, in Hebrew, the word people there um, is, is arm, uh, um, um, those who will be uh, um, humiliated. Uh, the word am um, is, is a countryman usage, which is like present day, it means it's, it's here. So yes, there will be a humiliation, I think, that takes place in heaven for those that don't choose God. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a present tense. In other words, because you don't live for God today, you will presently have a humiliation as well. Now, I think that's that's different for everybody, but it's part of the third curse. I can't think of a more humiliating thing than to be in God's church and, and to live so secondary for him, so thirdary for him, so consumed by this world that God basically looks at you and says, no, no, I'm casting you out of the church. You always have the ability to come back, but I'm casting you out of the church. What a, a incredibly humiliating thing to think about having happen to you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm explaining this gently because you know some of them, but the Hamptons, the church that I grew up in, had a very, very challenging time in Lander. And I watched it from the sidelines as a kid. And I remember feeling so bad for the Hamptons because there are some problems within the church in which, in which we're so vile and cancerous that I, I watched my, my pastor cry <laughs> before his people pleading that, 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 that okay, so again, this is why there are people within the church claiming that he wasn't a good pastor, and there was another person there that claimed to be the pastor. He was just a lay person. And, and I remember going, oh, I felt so bad for him, to the point where two or three, he gathered two or three men together that brought righteousness and went to the, to the people, and the church went from about 75 to about 40 overnight. I remember his heart just breaking over that situation because it, 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 was, it, was, it grew in the church, it was cancer in the church, but when those people left, the church just kind of went, oh, you can breathe. <laughs> like, it, like, it actually feels like a weight got thrown off of our backs. Um, about two years later, Bud went to Cheyenne, about two years later, I got to know a friend of mine uh, from high school whose dad was a pastor, he was at the assembly. We started talking about that situation, and those names happened to come up. And the, the pastor's son goes, oh, my dad does not work well with them. <laughs> they began to talk to me about these, these folks that were doing the same thing in that church as they, they did in Lander. And um, the point being that I can't imagine a more humiliating thing than one day to know you caused so much more frustration for the church than good that you are cast out. That you are cast out from both the church and the kingdom of God. Friends, today, I, I'm just simply saying, let's be a royal priesthood, something that God says, I'm pleased with you. You help the church, you grow the church, you have better, you have better, um, you are supporting me more than you are this world. And when people look at you, they see me. I, I just want us to be a people that, that are growing the kingdom come and not taking it out. Um, he is a good God, amen? amen. And uh, next week I'm closing the blinds of that window because I am so blinded <laughs> by that car. I can't, even, I can't even think of words in my brain right now. I apologize to you today for this. Um, but he is a good God. And he wants us to be a people that are of 
that he's pleased in, that, that, of a royal priesthood, that he doesn't cast outside of the church. Do you get it today? I'm sorry for the messed up words. I'm going to ask, talk to the neighbor, move that car. I love the day. <laughs> We're going to sing a song today that just wraps it up, that just says, God, um, I really want you to be the biggest deal that I've got going on. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Perfect. A little, little bit more. It's okay. He, he's a good God. He's a strong tower. Let's put our faith in him. Amen? All right. Just sing the song with us as we get going. Sometimes you just let, you, you turn people over to their, their sin. You turn them over to what they truly want, the world. You cast them out. You will pres preserve your heaven. You will preserve your church. You, you told Peter, not even hell will overcome this thing. You will preserve this church. And, and sometimes, God, I, I know what you do there. I've seen it firsthand. You cast out the thing that's harmed it. You can always come back, but, but Lord, I just pray we wouldn't get to that point. We, we'd look internally right now, and we would see maybe the mold that's growing in us. But if we're not careful, we'll take over the entire brick. And I, I just pray, Jesus, that uh, again, you'd be the God that we seek. You would be the name, the strong and mighty tower, the name that we live for, and we would give the best of what we have to you. That we would be the, 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 the bloodline that you are preserving, that you will keep, maintain. Once again, I pray your words were heard, <laughs> that the distracting parts will fall away today. I love you, God. I just ask you to join us in our conversation and a meal that we'll share in a moment with Garland. Let it be a, a joyous event for us. And 
just a, a time of good fellowship. Join us with that, God. Once again, we need you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a good day.